From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Irene Dunn and Cary Grant in Theodora Goes Wild. Lux presents Hollywood. Our play, the comedy romance of a girl who leads two lives. One as the prim and proper small town girl, the other as a writer of sensational novels. And what happens when the secret of her identity gradually gets out? Our cordial thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for your loyalty to Lux Flakes and Lux Toilet Soap. This kind of loyalty to our product makes the Lux Radio Theater possible. Our stars tonight are Irene Dunn, Cherry Grant, Kathleen Lockhart, and Sarah Hayden in our adaptation of Columbia Studios' grand screenplay, Theodora Goes Wild. We also bring you, as special guest, Miss Gwen Dew, Hollywood writer who recently went 50,000 miles around the world on $50. Louis Silvers is in charge of music. And now, the producer of the Lux Radio Theater, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. The triumphs of Irene Dunn and Cary Grant are among Hollywood's happiest inconsistencies. Both were brought here because of an ability to sing. Both scored their first screen hits in roles definitely dramatic. Yet it was not singing or drama, but pure comedy that raised them to their present peak of popularity. Miss Dunn's Hollywood fame, which dates from Cimarron, caught comedy's added luster with the release of the Columbia film Theodora Goes Wild. Since then, her talent in rollicking roles has set the country laughing in another Columbia picture, The Awful Truth, and an RKO's joy of living. Miss Dunn, off the screen, is a devotee of golf and lemon pie. She likes symphonic orchestras, plays the piano very well, and is among the nation's best-dressed women. A little over five feet four inches tall, she has brown hair, hazel eyes, and a dimpled chin. Beginning his career as an acrobat, Cary Grant has been an eccentric dancer, a clown, and a stilt walker. He also plays the piano and pays his servants well because he says part of their job is to listen to him play. Having demonstrated his comedy skill in Tapa, The Awful Truth, and Bringing Up Baby, Carey is currently seen in the Columbia picture Holiday. He's heard tonight as Michael Dane, while Miss Dunn plays Theodora Lynn. Featured in our cast are Kathleen Lockhart as Aunt Mary and Sarah Hayden as Rebecca Perry. It's curtain time now. And the Lux Radio Theater presents Irene Dunn and Cary Grant in Theodora Goes Wild. A meeting room in the public library at Linfield, a little town in Connecticut. The time is early evening. The scandalized members of the Linfield Literary Society have met for the definite purpose of discussing a sensational new novel by Carolyn Adams. Mrs. Rebecca Perry, president, is standing on the rostrum, the open book before her. Twenty women and a lone man hang breathlessly on her every word. You're very beautiful tonight, Pamela, Spencer said. The words mingled with the plaintive music that filled the room. Suddenly, he took her in his arms. She fought desperately to break out of his grasp. Let me go! Let me go! She could feel his breath on her cheek. And then, his lips on hers. Let me go! Let me go! Why, Jerry, what is it? Jerry, what is it? Stop the glass at once. What are we laughing on the other side of your face when you've had the brass serialized trash like this in your paper? I, I can't help it, Rebecca, but you should have seen your face while you were reading. Oh, boy, from the looks of you all, you'd never think the bugle was selling like hot cakes since the Caroline Adams book started running in it. Well, we oh, 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 you, you yellow journalist. You're on trial here. This literary circle isn't going to let trash like this come into our homes and corrupt our now, families. Wait just a second, Rebecca. As long as I can remember, this community stuck its head in the sand and said, there ain't no evil. Well, it's all right for you and your literary circle. Well, you're practically dead on your feet. Well, 
And your youngsters ought to know what it's all about. You can't keep civilization out of Linfield forever. You don't know what you're talking about. Quiet, please. We'll decide this once and for all. Theodora, what's the Lynn family got to say about this? Well, well, uh, Aunt Mary and Aunt Elsie told me to say that uh, they want this book stopped, and if it isn't, the Linfield Bugle will find itself without subscribers. I'm awful sorry, Jed. There you are. The Lynns of Linfield have spoken. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Is that plain enough, Jed Waterbury? Yes, that's plain enough. All right, I'll cut out printing the things. But I've already printed an extra hundred copies of today's episode. Come early and avoid the rush. <laughs> that's that. Meeting's adjourned, girls. Oh, Theodora. Oh, yes, Rebecca. Wait for me, Theodora. We can walk home together. Well, that'll be fine, Rebecca. I've been wanting to ask you if you had any message for Adley. I'm going into New York tomorrow to visit Uncle John. I do declare you're the most thoughtful girl I've ever known. I'll never be done thanking you for getting that daughter of mine to New York for a change of scenery. Oh, I was glad to do it, Rebecca. You know how fond I am of Adelaide. I swear to goodness, Theodora, you're a Lynn clear through. Just downright fine. Oh, I'll give you a batch of cookies to take to Adelaide. The soft ginger kind. They won't be all crumbs by the time they get to her. Oh, is there anything else I can do, Rebecca? No, child. I was going to say you could stop in and deliver the literary circle's message to that publisher, Stevenson, in New York. The one who's publishing the book. But no, Theodora Lynn, you're too much of a lady to even speak to a blackguard like that. I'll send him a telegram. I'll say, in the name of decency, this brazen press published by you. By you is a disgrace to our youth and the flower of young American womanhood. Signed Rebecca Perry, President of Linfield Literary Circle. <laughs> oh, excuse me, Mr. Stevenson, but Carolyn Adams is here. Well, send her in. Come in, come in. Oh, hello, Mr. Stevenson. Well, I'm glad to see you, Miss Lynn. Shh, please, please, Adam. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I will get confused. Come on, come on, sit down. Oh, incidentally, I, I got a telegram just now that might amuse you. I know. Signed, Rebecca Perry. And it doesn't amuse me. Mr. Stevenson, why, why did you have to sell those cereal rice to the Linfield Bugle? Oh. Well, have you got an aspirin, please? Well, sure. Yes, Mr. Stevenson? An aspirin, please. Yes, sir. No, I didn't know about the Bugle, Miss Lynn. I mean, Miss Adams. <laughs> but why not? I think it's very funny. Well, I don't. I had to sit and listen to it read out loud, and I give you my word... I almost died of shame. Well, shall we make that too well, aspirin? No fooling now. It was horrible. I suddenly realized that I was a writer of wide reputation and most of it bad. <laughs> I could see Linfield finding out the truth and Aunt Mary and Aunt Elsie disgraced forever. Well, the aspirin, Mr. Stevenson. Oh, no, no, no. For Miss Adams. Oh, here you are, Miss Adams. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Well, feel better? No, not my conscience. That feels worse. You know, you're a curious woman, Miss Adams. How did you come to write a book like that? Well, I'll never know. All I know is that I was raised in a small town by two maiden aunts. Have you ever been raised in a small town by two maiden... No. No, I'll bet not. Have you taught Sunday school for the past ten years? Well, no. Uh... Have you played the organ in church since you were 15? Why, no. Uh... Well, I have. And right now I ask myself, where did Carolyn Adams come from? How did all this start? But you, you must have known what you were doing to write a book that's sweeping the country. Well, I thought it was just romantic. Hmm. Well, what about the second book of yours? Where is it? Well, it just won't write, Mr. Stevenson. I've tried. Honest, I have. I stuff rags under my door at night so nobody will hear me, but my ants keep prowling. Have you ever had prowling ants, Mr. Stevenson? <laughs> no, but it does sound fatal. Well, it is. Oh, well, I'll have to go now. Uncle John's waiting. You see, he doesn't know I've got a publisher and a book. Nobody knows. Well, can't Uncle John wait? Just no, once, Miss Adams. No, Adam. he can't. Why? Well, I... I promised my wife the next time you came in, she could meet you. You, you what? Well, I had to. She's, she's that kind of a wife. But you promised me. You said that but nobody Ethel's would... But Ethel's a rabid your... fan of yours. Ethel's been making my life miserable. Yeah. Ethel's my wife. Hello. Ethel. Well, the door was open, darling, so I just 
Well, I'll never believe it. It can't be. Don't tell me you're Carolyn Adams. I've been dying to meet you. Oh, dear. Uh, Miss Adams, my my wife, Mrs. Stevenson. How do you do? Oh, it's too marvelous knowing you, Miss Adams. Oh, hello, Stevenson. The door was open, so I just wanted to... Well, who's there? Why is the door always open? Oh, don't mind me. Get out of here, Michael Dane, and well, close that door. Stevens, and first it's one person, and then it's two. Well, well, Michael, are you going? No, you can close your own doors, Arthur Stevenson. Well, one thing I'll say for Michael, he only goes where he's not invited. Oh, Miss Adams, I am sorry. I didn't know Michael would follow me over here. Caroline Adams, eh? Well, you ought to know me. I'm the man who painted the cover for your book and the uh, uh, glorious woman over Arthur's desk there. Well, she may be glorious, but she's also underdressed. Oh, well, that's evening clothes. That's the way you described her in your book. Wait a minute. This isn't some kind of a joke, is it? You're sure you're Caroline Adams? I wish you'd get out of here, Michael. What do you mean, is she sure she's Caroline Adams? Uh, well, well, Arthur, I don't know. I don't know, but uh, Caroline Adams ought to look like a woman who's lived. You know, a Samaritz tan, a Monte Carlo glitter in her eyes, a sort of a certain London weariness around the eyebrows. It doesn't... Why, Miss Adams, there is a certain bloom of innocence in your face that surprised me, too. Well, what did you expect to see? The tattooed woman? I must go now. Uncle John's waiting. Ah, uh, just a minute, Miss Adams. It's my curiosity. It takes hold of me and shakes me like a terrier shakes a rat. But, uh, but is that a manuscript you're carrying, Miss Adams? No. It's a box of ginger cookies, the soft kind, no crumbs. Fine. <laughs> you know, Miss Adams, I've had a craving for ginger cookies all week. May I have some? Oh, yes. Do have some. Take them all. Oh, thanks. I will. Mr. Huh. Stevenson, huh. Mrs. Stevenson, you must forgive me now because... I've really got to see Uncle oh, John. Oh, I just hoped you'd at least have dinner with us, Miss Adams. Well, I'm sorry, but I can't. You see, I must make an early train back home. Where's that? Uh, Ethel, my dear, Miss Adams lives out west. Yes, way out west on the range. Where the deer <laughs> and the antelope play. Michael, oh. shut up. Oh, but look, Arthur, darling, there are trains leaving for way out west all night long. Oh, Miss Adams, I won't take no for an answer. We'll meet you here at six. Well, it looks like that's that, Miss Adams. Well, we'll put you on the earliest possible train but after dinner. I didn't bring another dress, and I... Uh, Oh, well, all right, all right, but I've got to run now. Well, I'll be here, too. See you later. Oh, he won't be here, Miss Adams, not if we can help it. Well, if I could only be sure of that. Goodbye. Goodbye, dear. Six o'clock. Thanks, Uncle John. The usual check for $300. That's all we'll need. You can put the rest away. <laughs> Such virtue. Oh, uh, by the way, Theodora... When are you going to let me show you the town? Oh, sometime, maybe. I see. You still think I'm a gay old dog, don't you? <laughs> confidentially, Uncle John. Are you really wicked? Well, confidentially, honey, I'm just a little short of terrific. <laughs> oh, you know, somehow I don't quite believe you, Uncle. Oh, yes, you do. I can tell by the pained expression on your face. Just like your Aunt Mary. Now, listen, baby. I think that we... Uh... Did anybody ever call you baby? No. That's pity. Nobody in Linfield ever will. Uh, by the way, Theodora, does Rebecca Perry suspect anything about Adelaide? Oh, no, no, no. She thinks she's working for Mrs. Jameson. Well, where is Adelaide? I, I thought I'd see her. No, she had an appointment at the doctor's about the <laughs> baby's formula or something. <laughs> oh, what a story for Linfield. Adelaide secretly married to Roger. Adelaide and Roger have a baby. And you hide Adelaide and the baby away with your sinful old uncle in New York. Because Roger won't get a dime of his money until he gets a diploma or something. <laughs> you know, Theodora, you know this low trick you're playing on Linfield and Rebecca Perry tells me there's hope for you. Now, there's nothing low about it. Oh, I've got to leave, Uncle. Oh, what for? Well, I, um, I've got to make the six o'clock train for home. Oh. Train, eh? Well, there's a sparkle in your eyes I've never seen before. You know, Theodora... I think I'll be proud of you yet. Not if I can help it, you old Roy. <laughs> <laughs> well, here we are, all settled a nice, intimate table off in the corner where nobody can see you, Miss Adams. Oh, Miss Adams, you're so... <laughs> Incognito, it's Bob. <laughs> uh, shall I order you a cocktail, Ethel, dear? Please do, darling. I'll have a martini. What about you, Miss Adams? Oh, no, none for me, thank you. Oh, waiter, uh, two martinis, please. You don't drink, Miss Adams, and you're so imaginative. You must admit you do make people curious. Now, Michael says... Now, why the devil did you have to mention his name? You know all you have to do is to say Michael, then there's a cloud of smoke and up he pops. Look, over there, near the door. No, it is Michael. Well, well, hello, everybody. Mind if I sit down? Mind? What do you think you're doing now? Sitting down. 
I tracked you people here because I just had to know. Had to know what? Stevenson, you keep out of there. You... Miss Adams, it's this. I've got to know. I'm worn out from arguing with myself. Did you really write that book? Yes, I really wrote that book, oh, as you well. call it. And I, I wish... I, I wish you just wouldn't have dinner with us. All right, I won't have dinner with you. You three do all the eating. I'll sit here and starve. Starve? After all those cookies? Oh, oh martini, sir. No, that's fine, waiter. One here and one here. Yeah, and one here. Waiter, dear. Oh. Waiter. Yes, ma'am? You might as well bring two. Oh, yes, my God. She lives. She breathes. She speaks. Where are we going, please? Grand Central Station. Didn't you say you had to catch a train? Of course, the evening is still young, even if Arthur and Ethel did go home. I don't see why we Where should... are we going? I just told you, Grand Central Station. Well, if you're taking me to Grand Central Station, why did you tell the driver to drive through Central Park? Oh, oh you're much too practical for a creative artist, Miss Adams. Now, just because Grand Central is downtown and the park is uptown, there's no reason why you can't get downtown by way of uptown. <laughs> Einstein. I never heard of such a thing. Ah, but Pamela, the heroine in your book, would have loved this. New York by night, love in a taxi, and Spencer, attentive at her side, whispering sweet, bewildering nothing. Well, you're not Spencer. You're a raving Uh, mad... uh, uh, No, I'm not. I'm an artist. You're another. We understand each other. We create. Well, yes. (laughs) That's so. Yes. Well, now, look, Miss Adams. Uh, Carolyn, if you don't mind, I made you miss your train deliberately. I wanted to get you away from the Stevenson... What is Arthur Stevenson, after all? A businessman, a maker of money. Well, I don't understand. What are you driving at? Well, now, you see, Carolyn, I'm completing a painting up at my apartment, and I want your opinion of it desperately. No, I'm awfully sorry. Ah, no etchings. No, nothing obvious like that. I, uh... I want your opinion of this painting as one creative artist to another. You do understand, don't you? Well, if you put it that way, yes, I I can see. But I remember when I was writing... Lovely little place. So cozy and intimate. Yes, I thought you'd appreciate it. Coming from an expert, that's something. Me? Yeah, yeah. I was referring to the place you wrote about where Pamela was lured. Poor, poor Pamela. Oh, that's it. That canvas over there, isn't it? Yes, it is. I'll uh, I'll just remove the cover so that you can see it. There, what do you think of it? Another underdressed woman. Oh, well, she's charming, charming. Yes, yes. Carolyn, Carolyn, did I tell you how beautiful you look this evening? No. Oh, but Carolyn, you do, you do. Oh, you take that look out of your eyes, Mr. Dane. <laughs> oh, but Carolyn, now here, you're adorable. Don't, don't you dare, don't you dare, you let me go, well, you I... let me go. Oh, how dare you kiss me. Uh, uh, now, Carolyn, come here. <laughs> You stay right where you are. But, darling, you don't <laughs> seem to understand. You, you, you. you no, no, no. I'll pick it up. Ah, as you see, you dropped your face. That's what I told you. No, no, Carolyn, don't go. go. Where are you going, Carolyn? Now, it's one off. I'll call the policeman. If you dare, you come up and say, I'll call the policeman. You, you. In a moment, our stars, Irene Dunn and Cary Grant, return in Act Two of Theodora Goes Wild. Now, in our brief intermission, we listen to two pretty girls home from a dance as they talk the party over before going to bed. Oh, well, there go the boys. Gosh, I'm tired. Oh, it was a swell dance, wasn't it? Mm, I'll say. And you were the big moment, Betty. Oh, Jean, did you see how Jack kept cutting in? Oh, I knew he would. You're terribly popular these days. And no wonder. <laughs> You're darling to say that, Jean. Especially when you know and I know that just a month ago I was little Miss Not Wanted. Oh, don't talk that way, Betty. Well, it's true, though. Oh, when I think of the chances I took with daintiness. But now, but now, speaking of daintiness, let's lux our undies and our stockings, too. Let's do it this very minute. A minute or so a day with Lux does protect daintiness because Lux flakes remove every trace of perspiration odor. They leave silk things sweet and fresh. And, in addition, keep the colors new-looking longer. We all know how important it is, especially in warm weather, to guard against an offense that spoils popularity, kills romance. For daintiness, 
Lux under things after each wearing. Anything safe in water is safe in Lux Flakes. Our producer, Mr. DeMille. We continue with Theodora Goes Wild, starring Irene Dunn and Cary Grant. It's Sunday afternoon, several days after Theodora's trip to New York. The townspeople of Linfield are strolling sedately past the Lynn residence. On the front porch, Theodora, Aunt Elsie, Aunt Mary, and Rebecca Perry, on their respective rockers, are watching the placid scene before them. There's an atmosphere of unruffled calm. It is almost too calm. About time we were discussing this year's charity bazaar, Rebecca. Yes, Mary. That's what I was going to say. If it's going to be a success, I guess it's kind of up to the Lynns again. Yes, you and Elsie and Theodora do set things to humming. Mm-hmm. That reminds me, Theodora. Yes, Rebecca. I hope Adelaide isn't keeping late hours or traipsing around the city all by herself. Dear me, no. She's home most of the time at her work, reading to Mrs. Jameson. She never goes out except... Except what, Theodora? You were saying that... Uh, what? What was I saying? She never goes out except... No, she never goes out except... Except when she goes out. That don't make sense, Theodora. Oh, Mary. What, Elsie? Uh, what's that man doing walking up and down in front of the house with the dog whistling? What man? Oh, oh, that's lady looking tramp. Do you know him, Theodora? I? No, no, I don't know Raven him. looking, isn't he? Nice day of the week to be doing a jig up the street. Look, he's swinging on the front gate. Get away from that gate, young man. Get away. Shoot. No, wait, wait. Uh, I'll go and talk to him. I'll talk to him. Uh, don't get too close to him, Theodora. Oh, that Michael Dane, you oh. get away from him. Well, how do you do? Right small weather we're having, man. You get away from here and leave this town just as fast as you can go. Now, is that any way to treat a friend, an old fellow creative artist? <laughs> oh, this is my dog, Jake. Say hello, Jake. Oh, listen to me. Fine. My aunts and the worst gossip in town are watching from that porch. Mm -hmm. And if they suspected what you know about me, they'd have fits. What do you don't say? Now, you be a nice man and tip your hat politely and get away from oh, here. Oh, you've got me wrong, lady. I didn't come here to call. I'm looking for work, lady. Work? You don't have to tell me what kind of work you're up to. The fine old homestead you got here, lady. Of course, your lawn looks seedy. Those vines need training. You know what you need? A gardener. Don't be absurd. We never had one. Oh, ho, ho, lady, you've got one. What's now you get away from here, Michael Dane. What does he want, Theodore? Oh, it's nothing, I'm I want work, ma'am, work. You get me this job, Theodore Lynn, or your name is Carolyn Adams. You wouldn't dare do a thing like that. Oh, yes, I would. Why, you're the... Oh, well? Yes, yes. Well, all right, all right, blackmailer. <laughs> Lawnmower never made so much noise before. And that's because we never had a gardener before. Oh, look at him out there. The way he's taken over this house, him and his dog, eating us out of house and home. Well, we did need a gardener, and Mr. Dewberry's worked as a gardener for years. Mr. Dewberry, huh? What outlandish kind of name is that? That's what he said his name was. Oh, he's got the dog hitched to the lawnmower. Half of Lindsay is standing on the sidewalk watching him. Shut that window, Elsie. I'm going clean out of my head. Uh, see here, Mary, I'll settle with no, him. No, Elsie, I'll go. No, I'll speak to him. Michael Dane. Well, howdy, neighbor. Morning, squire. Get along, little dog. What do you think you're doing? You Get can't stay just three room service in our front yard. Oh, now, wait a minute. I can't disappoint people who've walked blocks to look me over, can I? Now, look here. You unhitch that barking horse and stop this nonsense. Well, all right. There you are, Jake, my good dog. I hope you've learned your lesson. It's a disgrace to have a little fun in Linfield, and don't you forget it. I want to talk to you, Mr. Dewberry. How did you track me to Linfield? Homing instinct, like a pigeon. Tell me. Well, if you must know, you left a few papers on the floor in your wild flight from my apartment. You remember when you dropped your purse? Oh, I see. Well, well, now that you've had your little laugh, why don't you go away? What are you digging up that rose bush for? Stop it. Nobody told you to dig... Well, now, it's like this, lady. You keep a bush in one place too long, it uses up all the nourishment in that one little spot of ground. And what happens? Stops growing, settles down to a dull existence. I always say people are the same way. That's why I came to Linfield. Yeah. 
I thought you needed transplanting, Theodora, and I found out you do, so I'm going to transplant you. You're going to <clears throat> transplant me? Yes, I am. Uh, um, uh, what sort of berries are ripe this time of year? Blueberries, why? Well, I'm going to transplant you to the woods tomorrow. We're going to pick blueberries. Oh, no, we're not. I can't go skipping off into the woods with you just like that. Uh, 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 must I threaten you again? Theodora, do you want your name to be Carolyn Adams, or will Shh, you... Now, be quiet, be quiet. Uh, Mr. Dewberry, who gave you permission to dig up that rose bush? Well, uh, Miss Theodora did, Miss Mary. Did you, Theodora? Because if nobody gave him permission, he can clear out of here this minute. Well, yeah, yes, I did. I, I gave him permission, Aunt Mary. Very well, Theodora. Your Aunt Elsie and I want to talk to you. Come in the house this minute. Yes, Aunt Mary. Oh, uh, Miss Theodora. What? Oh, berries are ripe, blueberries are ripe, the berries are ripe tomorrow. You gotta get up, you gotta get up, you gotta get up tomorrow. Oh, oh, oh I gotta lie down. I can no more. Mm. <laughs> I thought you said you were a berry picker. Oh, oh no, no cracks you. I, I'm not used to bending over, that's all. <laughs> Why, you're a wreck, Mr. Dewberry. You know what your trouble is? Oh, what? You need nourishing, new soil, transplanting. Ah, you're a nasty character. How about some berries? <laughs> well, here's a pail. Dig in. No, drop them in my mouth. <laughs> I'll chew them for you. Well, drop them way back so they just slide down. <laughs> Oh, dear. Oh, please. Well, you ought to be ashamed to laugh like that, out loud and everything. What would Linfield say? Look, has anybody ever been known to laugh in Linfield? Well, there's a case or two on record. Yeah, well, somebody must have been tickling them. You know, you're a strange, sad case, girly. Did you know that? No, tell me, doctor. Well, to start with, you're really a nice girl, full of normal desires. But I'll tell you what's happening to them. What? They're being strangled to death. Oh, dear, dear that's murder. Oh, it's suicide. What Linfield doesn't let you feel, you write about. Love, laughter, what you want to experience and can't. Yes, yes, go on, doctor. Well, there's a happy world out yonder, girlie. Break loose, be yourself. Tell Linfield to go take a jump in the lake. <laughs> Imagine I'm married taking a jump in the lake. <laughs> well, you won't be a free, happy soul until you do tell them. I know what I'm talking about. It's tough to fight your family and background and be yourself, but I did. Yeah, sure. They had me all set to follow in Papa's footsteps, be a banker and a statesman. I wanted to paint. I painted. Oh, I knew you would. You're so brave, aren't you? <laughs> Want a berry? Sure, oh, stop. Start dropping, lady. All right. I'll make a trade with you. If you give me that cigarette you just lit, I'll, I'll let you have some more berries. It's a deal. Thanks. And now, a question. What, may I ask, is little Theodora going to do with the cigarette now that she has it? Well, Michael will eat his berries while Theodora puffs contentedly on her cigarette. Monarch of all she surveys. Oh, oh, I'll bet you never smoked in your life. Mm, like I never got up early, huh? Like I never picked a berry. Mm, you presume things, Mr. Dewberry. I'll go ahead, smoke. Burst into flames, see if I can. Oh, don't worry about me. I won't burst it. Here, <coughs> <coughs> oh. <coughs> oh. yeah, yeah. here's a handkerchief, I stupid. <coughs> oh, I'm all right. Well, I'll wipe your eyes for you, you ninny. <coughs> I'm all right, Michael. I'm, I'm all right. Are you all right, dear? I'm fine. Fine. Oh, you're lovely. Lovely. Michael. Darling. You, you really meant it this time, didn't you, Michael? Uh-huh. The sun's up. It's a new day. It... Oh, Michael, it's Sunday. Sure, I guess it is Sunday. Oh, but don't you know what that means? Oh, it's what? Sunday. The only way we can get back to the house is down Main Street. What about it? Well, church will be on. They'll see us, and they'll see us with our berry pails. Well, they won't see us with machine guns. What are you worrying about? Well, I can't help it. I'm, I'm worried about Rebecca Perry and the Linfield Literary Circle. Everybody. The meeting is now in order. Since this is a special meeting, ladies, we'll dispense with the usual order of business. Mrs. Chairman. Mary Lynn, since this is the special meeting, and since it's been called in my house, I'd like to know why. You know as well as I do, Mary Lynn. It's Theodora. She's been seen gadding around all over the place with that suspicious-looking gardener of yours. <laughs> Rebecca, and all of you, Theodora might make a few little mistakes out of a generous impulse. 
but she couldn't do anything downright wrong. <laughs> Matter of fact, the gardener's leaving in the morning. When did you discharge him? Uh, I, well, that is, I'm going to discharge him right now. He's right back of the house in the gardener's cottage, and you can all come and watch me discharge him. Ladies, will somebody make a motion on that? Here, Rebecca Perry. I make the motion, I second it, and I carry it. Are you coming or ain't you? Aren't you? All right, Mary. Come along, girl. Michael, I've got to go. I've got to, I tell you. Sure, I know. Sit down. No, no, I only came to tell you there's something up. Huh? They're holding a meeting in the house right now, and it's about you. About us. Us? Oh, what a grand topic for a meeting. Let's hold one ourselves. Come on. Oh, Michael, you're such a fool. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Come here, darling. Come oh, on. what? Oh, you're swell. Do you know it? You're grand. Mr. Dewberry, uh, we've come to settle Theodora. You. Oh, you here, Theodora? After I just did. Oh, Theodora. Now, what do you think, Mary Lynn? Uh, I think we'd better go back to the house and go on with the meeting. Meeting nothing? Come out here, Theodora Lynn. As secretary of the Linfield Literary Society, what have you got to say for yourself? Come in. Come in? Yes, come in. Don't stand there gaping. Listen to me. I want you to listen to Michael. I came out here to Michael's cottage to see him, to tell him that I don't want him to go. But he's got to go because you want him to. Theodora! It doesn't matter what I want. You're telling me what's good for me, what's proper, what isn't proper. You've been telling me that since I was three years old and I'm sick of it. You've glared and scolded and frightened me all out, Stamper. Now I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something you'll never forget. There's no law that can put that gardener off these premises. He's going to stay. It's a free country. I'm over 21, and what I choose to do is none of Linfield's business. I invite the whole town to take a jump in the lake. Oh, and just one more thing before you go. Aunt Elsie, Aunt Mary, Rebecca, all of you. I love him. I love him, and I always will. And there's no one in this town that can stop me. Come on, girl. <laughs> well, Michael. Uh, well, Theodora. I told them off, didn't I? Oh, yeah, you sure did tell them off, didn't you? And it... It was the truth. <laughs> Swell. I was thrilled to hear myself say it, and proud, too. Right then I knew I never could have sent you away. <laughs> yeah, well, uh... Well, when you finally let go, you certainly rocked the world, didn't you? I guess... I guess you and I have a lot to talk about, Michael. <laughs> yes, yeah, I guess we have. Well, we better not start tonight, though. It's... Are you proud of me, Michael? Oh, I'll tell the world, baby. Baby? And Uncle John said nobody in Linfield would ever call me baby. Good night, darling. Good night, darling. <laughs> Michael? Michael? It's I. May I come in? Michael! If you don't answer by the time I count three, I'm coming in anyway. One, two, three. Here I come. Come out, come out, wherever you are. Come on. <laughs> Michael, where are you? Oh, oh. oh, Jake, you're good for nothing. What are you doing up on that chair? You know you're not supposed oh, to. Oh. Where's your master, Jake? Where's Michael? <laughs> Jake. Jake, come here, little boy. Come here. What's that fastened to your collar? A note. <laughs> oh. Oh. Well, what are you crying about? You don't even know what's in it. Listen to this. Then you'll have something to cry about. You're free, baby. Step out and be yourself. There are big things ahead. And you'll travel faster, alone. I'm on my way again to find more gardens to set in order. Good luck. And kiss Carol and Adam for me. My <laughs> oh. We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
In this intermission, before our stars return in Act Three of Theodora Goes Wild, we bring you Miss Gwen Dew, former fashion editor, beauty editor, and news columnist for such well-known magazines as Movie Classic, Motion Picture, and Screen Book. One day, she decided to see the world outside of Hollywood. So she sailed for parts unknown with a typewriter, a five-dollar camera, and fifty dollars in cash. Now she's back to tell the audience of the Lux Radio Theater how that fifty dollars carried her round about the world for 50,000 miles. You certainly made $50 go a long way, Miss Duke. Well, let me tell you how far it really did go, Mr. DeMille. I heard the beat of the rhythmic surf at Waikiki Beach. I saw the blue and gold roofs of Peking, China, 20,000 miles of rice terraces on a Filipino mountainside, and in Zamboango... Where the monkeys have no tails. Oh, I found that monkeys do have tails, Mr. DeMille. And my mistake, huh? I saw 300 golden bronze men danced at midnight, far out in a Balinese jungle. I was entertained by the Sultana of Sulu and the son of the Sultan of Johor. I met Charlie Chaplin in Tokyo. At Amalfi, Italy, I rested a while on a beautiful spot where Greta Garbo had recently been staying. I talked to everyone, from Cooley to King. Now, before half our audience gets the idea that they, too, can see the world for $50 and without having to join the Navy... Perhaps you'd better tell us what the catch is. Well, when I left, I had hopes of writing up my experiences and perhaps a few interviews. I had absolutely no assurance that anyone was going to buy any. But luckily for me, most of the quarter of a million words I wrote and the thousand pictures I took with a $5 Kodak were sold to newspapers. And when the going was very tough, I often wrote publicity for hotels in exchange for room and meal. Now, which of the sites you saw and the people you met proved the most interesting? Oh, undoubtedly the trip I made for three days up the Yangtze River in China. At the end of this journey, I secured the first interview Madame Chiang Kai-shek had given in three years. Well, to me, the most exciting phase of your trip is still that $50 capital. After all, the fragrant air of the South Seas makes very nice breathing, but you can't eat it. Well, Mr. DeMille, I'll admit on more than one occasion I went without a meal. But after all... If a person has determination, of course, a little ability of some kind, if he keeps his chin up, doesn't let his appearance grow careless, it's amazing how far he can go. And part of keeping your chin up, you know, is always being perfectly groomed. I don't mean expensively dressed, but always in bandbox condition. And incidentally, Mr. DeMille, you'll be interested to know that this program, in a way, shared that trip with me. Now, I'll be even more interested if you'll explain how. Well, you see, I had to travel very light, for you can well imagine I didn't have 20 trunks with me. I had blouse silk lingerie, service weight hose for daytime wear and chiffon for evening, number of washable blouses, fabric gloves, and so forth. Now, those things don't take up much room, but what's even more important, I could care for them myself. And your own Lux Flakes, Mr. DeMille, are what I use to keep them looking always bright and crispy. First, I thought I'd have to carry a supply of Lux Flakes from home, but I soon learned I could buy Lux almost anywhere in the world, and that helped immensely. And make no mistake, looking at all times immaculately well-groomed, whether I was talking to porters or peasant women or interviewing presidents or dictators, was a very important part of my formula. Yes. Wherever you may wander, Miss Dew, you'll always find Lux, for it's a fact that Lux also circles the globe. Yep. Now that I am home again, I am glad to know all that has happened. For I know now what people mean when they're talking about Bubbling Well Road or the Rue de la Paix. And what it is like to have been on a flying bridge on a dreamy tropical night, somewhere between Singapore and Egypt, with the stars just out of reach. And to those of you who are listening tonight and who read my stories while I was gone, I offer a thousand thanks for it was you who gave the world to me. Mm. Thank you, Miss Dew, for bringing it back to us. <laughs> Irene Dunn, Cary Grant, and our all-star cast in Act Three of Theodora Goes Wild. <laughs> Michael's apartment in New York a few days later. It's morning. Michael, who from his tousled and foggy appearance has apparently had a sleepless night, 
is sitting at the breakfast table. Standing solicitously at his elbow, tray in hand, is Tony, Michael's Filipino servant. Michael is looking at Tony questioningly, as if he isn't sure, doesn't quite believe what Tony's been telling him, or would rather not believe it. Huh? What? What'd you say, Tony? Your father telephone. They say he'll be here at 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock? What time is it now? 10 o'clock. Oh, stop saying 10 o'clock. Why didn't you wake me before? I wake you, but you no wake. Oh, oh, there he is now. He didn't even announce himself. Let him in, Tony. Let him in. Jay! Jay, how'd you get here? Tony, how'd Jake get here? Hello, Michael. Oh. Oh, hello, Theodora. I came to return your dog, Michael. You forgot him. Yeah, well... Oh, Tony, Tony, do something. Take Jay. Take him in the kitchen. Give him a bone. Have you got a bone? No bone, uh, but got nice lemon pie. Oh. Yes, Jay. Well, uh, thanks, Theodora. I, I guess you want to know why I left a note and ran away. Oh, yes, uh, the note. Oh, I know all about that. You wrote it because I threw myself at your head and you were frightened. No, dear, no. It's because I felt the same way about you. Oh, Theodora, don't look at me like that in your prim little Linfield bonnet. Please believe me. I love you, dear, but... But what, Michael? Well, in view of my circumstances, I had no right to go playing at hearts with a swell person like you. What circumstances, Michael? If you don't go now, you'll find out soon enough. Now, please go now, Theodore. I'll meet you at the Ritz for lunch. Oh, Tony, take it. He's downstairs now. Now, please go, please go. He's a little difficult about something. Well, who's a little difficult? Just today on his way up. Well, all right. Go and open the door for him. Yes, sir. Now, now, go on, Theodore, please. Oh, but please. I don't know where the Ritz is. Now, you're stalling, dear. Oh, go by on. Michael Dane. I... Well, now, look, look, will you go in another room or go and sit down someplace? Please, I'll go and sit down someplace, right over here. Oh, Mind? where is he? Oh, hello, Father. Oh, hello, son. Hmm. Aren't you going to say hello to me, too, Michael? Oh, Agnes. Hello. I wasn't expecting you. Ah, uh, fine, son, running out of town like that. Where were you? Oh, who's this? Hello? Oh, uh... Miss, uh, Lynn. Yeah, Lynn from the Stevenson office. Uh, Miss Lynn, my father. How do you do, Miss Lynn? How do you do? I'm very glad to know you, Miss Lynn. I'm Mrs. Dane. What? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, excuse me, my, my wife, Miss Lynn. Oh, how do you do? Well, Michael, did you drift back to town accidentally, or did you remember that I'm giving a reception for the governor on the 20th? Of course, I remember. Well, that's all I came for. And, of course, you'll be there with Agnes? With Agnes? With Agnes. Oh, no. Look, Father, this pretense of a happy marriage simply can't go on. It's been washed up for five years. It was your idea in the first place. Agnes is just as sick of it as I am. I think I'm a little sicker. I thought we agreed there would be no divorce as long as I held public office. You owe that much to the name of Dane, especially after your choice of a profession. Well, you know what's expected of you, Michael. Come on, Agnes. Goodbye, Michael, dear. I can scarcely wait for the governor's reception. <laughs> Goodbye, Miss Lynn. Hmm. Well, Theodora, is it all perfectly clear now? Yes, very clear. You know, Michael, I think you need an artist model. I need a what? An artist model. What for? Well, you know very well what for. To mow the lawn and transplant things, a little plain and fancy whistling, you oh, know. Yo, yo, yo. Oh, yeah, oh, pardon me, it's a joke. <laughs> I get it very funny. You mean I insisted on gardening for uh -huh, you? And and I've been the favor and model for you. You see, you're living in a jail, too. You can't call your soul your own. Tied to a woman you don't love who doesn't love you, and so scared well, of Papa you're afraid to breathe. No, well, our situations are very much alike. No, they're not. I just happen to have respect for the old boy, that's all. I see. And you love me, Michael? Oh, you know I do, darling. And when I'm free, the world is ours. Well, about when will the world be ours? Well, just that father serve out his term as lieutenant governor. I'm sure he won't run after that. That means within two years. Well, Michael, darling, to people of our age, two years is a lifetime. Well, it may seem that way, Theodora. Theodora, where are you going? I'm going to use your phone if you don't mind. Well, no. Hello? Hello, is this the desk? Those boxes and things that were left in the foyer, will you send them up to Mr. Dane's apartment, please? Thank you. Oh, wait a minute. What boxes? What things? Mm hmm. Hmm, some new outfits I just bought. No more prim little Linfield bonnets. Hats, hats that sit on an angle like this. Now, wait a... And gowns, baby, backless. And now show me the tool house. Theodora, what do you think you're doing? Moving in. After all, what's a little scandal in the life of a model? Are you little... Oh, you're moving in, are you? Moving in. Tony! Miss Lynn is moving in. Pack up, Tony. I'm moving out. <laughs> Carolyn, uh, Miss Adams, what's happened to you? Why, what do you mean, Mr. Stevens? Well, your, 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 your clothes, you're so different. 
Is that a silver fox? Oh, genuine. And wait till you see me in my backless dress. Just for the evening, of course. Oh, fine. What evening? Oh, now, let's not be too social. I've come to your office on business, Arthur. I came here to have a fight. Fight? I'm dissatisfied with the treatment I get from my publisher. I mean you. Well, in short, why don't I get any publicity around here? Publicity? But my, my, my dear Miss Adams, you, you my never... My dear Miss Adams, my you, dear Miss Adams, yes, you sit there and call me Miss Adams, but who else knows I'm Carolyn Adams? Well, you, Nobody. Uh, uh, the widest selling author in the country and who knows anything about me? Uh, Does anyone know that I'm fairly young and modern? Well, no, uh, but they're going to. Now, I'll give you one more chance, Mr. Stevenson Publishing Company. I want publicity and I want a lot of it. I want my picture on every jacket of every book of mine that's sold. And I want the story of Theodore Lynn and Carolyn Adams splattered over every page of every town in the unit, but, and uh, that goes for the Limpio Bugle, too. Now, now, look here. What, what, what are you doing? Yes? Yeah, Miss Baldwin, will you come in and bring your book, please? Oh, and one aspirin for Mr. Stevenson. Oh. No good. Well, look at her picture. Look at her clothes. It's shocking. But she is pretty. Fanny, you ought to be ashamed. She's a disgrace to this town. I'll see Mary Lynn about this. Elsie, Elsie. Oh, Mary, what is it? Paper, the bugle. It's Theodora, Elsie. Theodora's gone wild. Aha. And in my next book, Gentlemen of the Press, I'm telling about a small-town girl who always wanted to be called baby. She goes to the big city and meets a tall, handsome stranger, and she is called baby. Is that the story of your life, Miss Adams? Well, I shouldn't wonder. And who is the man? Oh, no, please. One question, Miss Adams. This is Michael Dane's apartment. Uh, yes, gentlemen, it is. Yeah! And you can tell your papers, gentlemen, the whole thing is a frame-up. I don't even know the lady. I've never been to Linfield in my life. Then why is she using your apartment, Mr. Dane? Yeah, why? Why? Well, 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 well it's a mistake. That's all. It, 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 oh, get out of here. Yeah! He denies the whole story, Miss Adams. Says he doesn't even know you. Oh, now, does he really? When are we going to get the dope on this thing, Miss Adams? Yeah, the work. Well, are you gentlemen going to the governor's reception? We will if you say so. Then, gentlemen, I say so. I tell you, Michael, it's got to stop. All this publicity. I tell you, it will ruin my chances. Oh, I've been doing my best, Father. I've denied everything she said. What more can I do? Was there anything new in the papers today? No, she can't do anything else now. It'll all blow over. Michael, Michael. Oh, what is it, Agnes? I hope you're satisfied. She's here. What? Yes, here. Carolyn Adams. Here? Here at the governor's reception? Not only at the governor's reception, she's dancing with the governor. Michael! All right, all right, all right. And the reporters all over the place, they're taking pictures one after another. Get out there, get out there and get her away. Take her out on the terrace, anywhere, but get her away from the governor. All right, but how? Go on, go on, go on. Get out on that terrace. Go on, go on. Ouch, that's my elbow. Yes, and this is my father's house. Now, listen, Theodora, if you cause any more scandal here tonight, I won't see you again for a lifetime. That also goes if you aren't out of this house in 15 minutes. That also goes if you don't get out of my apartment, out of New York, inside of two days. Is that clear? Michael, did you mean all that big speech? Yes, I meant every word of it. That I'm to go back to Linfield? Mm, to Linfield. And, and wait? And wait, dear. I'll then be free in two years. It, it, it's really... Goodbye, Michael. Yes, darling. Oh... <sighs> Oh, no, it's nothing to go to pieces about, dear, especially here. All Don't... right. I'll, I'll go back home. But I would like something to remember you by, Michael. Sure, sure, anything, dear. A kiss? Well, well, not here. When I see you off, I'll come to the train. Oh, no, you won't. You won't come to the train. You'll be afraid. Now, Michael, now. All right, darling. Very well. You win. Darling. What? Hold me close. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hold it! Hey. Thank you, Miss Adams. Wait a minute. What? What is this? A picture, Mr. Dean. And a honey. Yay! Yeah. Pictures, newspapers. This was your idea, Theodora. Why, Michael? If I ever said I loved you, I must have been crazy. Goodbye. My train's on time. 
Come, Elsie. I just asked the station man. Oh, Mary, listen. Is that a band? It's the whole Pike and Plum Corps. Oh. Afternoon, Miss Lynn. Jed Waterbury, what's the band doing down here at the station? I invited him. Why? Got the whole town out to welcome Theodora back home. Jed Waterbury, I could slap your face. Oh, Mary. <laughs> well, I could. Theodora's been away almost two years, and the whole thing had blown over, and now he comes along and stirs it all up again. Here comes the train. <laughs> Understand, I'm a free man, free as the air. Yeah. I'm gonna marry Theodora. What? I said I'm gonna marry her. I love her. What? I said I love her. I, I... Oh my. There she is. Take the baby now. The baby? Hand her down, please. Oh, Theodora. Oh, it's oh. Don't faint. Don't faint. Oh, We've got to get the matter? Matter. What's the matter? Don't stop now. The whole town's talking. Oh, dear. Don't be silly. This isn't my baby. What? No, it's Adelaide Perry's. She got off at the other end with her husband. Say, uh, Theodora. Jed Waterbury. You better tell that story to that young fellow who was here a minute ago. What young fellow? He uh, disappeared when he saw the baby. Who? I think his name was Dewberry. Dewberry? <laughs> Dewberry? Aunt Mary, hold the baby. Where is he? Michael? Michael? Wait, where are you going, Theodora? Michael? Stop, Michael. <sighs> Hello, Michael. Hmm. You forgot your child. Oh, you idiot. You said it. I came here to tell you I was free, that I wanted to marry you. And what happens? What happens? You, you, you mother. I'm not a mother. That wasn't my baby. It was Adelaide oh. Perry's. I was just doing her a good turn. Oh, oh, you mean, oh, then, then. then no. Oh. Oh, aren't you an idiot? Yeah, I am. But you've done your good turn for the day, haven't you? Yes. Yes, well, uh, would you do another and kiss me, Theodora? Oh, Michael. I'd love to. We say farewell to Theodora Goes Wild. In a moment, Irene Dunn and Cary Grant return to take a verbal bow. But first, a word from Melville Ruick. Before our stars return for their curtain call, let me ask the women of our audience a question. When do you wash dishes? After every meal? Twice a day? Once a day? There's a lot of debate on this subject, so this may interest you. Time studies show that the combined dishes of two meals can be done in one-third less time than if washed separately. That is, if the dishes have been scraped and covered with warm water after the first meal. That's one way to cut dishwashing time. Another way is to use Lux Flakes. They dissolve so fast, make such rich suds, that dishes sparkle in almost no time. And while you're washing the dishes, Lux is gently caressing your hands, guarding them against dishpan redness. In fact, women everywhere consider Lux actual beauty care for their hands. It has no harmful alkali to sting and bite your skin, dry and split your nails. Since you have Lux in your house for fine things, why not try it for dishes? Get the thrifty big box of Lux tomorrow. Mr. DeMille. Back to our stars now for a brief appearance, in which we find them cast as themselves. Mr. Grant, having just returned from Hawaii, is about to plunge into India's foreign climb by starting work in RKO's Gunga Din. And you, Miss Dunn, what have you to report about current screen activities? Well, Mr. DeMille... I'm engaged in one of Hollywood's most popular pastimes. It's far more popular than enjoyable. I'm story hunting. I'm waiting to make another picture, but it seems before we can start, we have to have something to make a picture about. That's a shrewd observation, Miss Dunn. I have a great part for you in Union Pacific, but we won't start shooting on that until September. How about you, Carrie? Any ideas for Irene? Why, uh, 
Why, yes, Mr. DeMille. Funny, just this week I was thinking about it. Well, give me a chance to think, too. What is it? Well, it's just a thing for you, Irene. Now, at the beginning of the story, you're a small-town girl, living with a couple of maiden aunts, you see. Yes. Yeah, now, no, all your life you wanted to do things and go places, but you never could. Uh -huh. You know, small-town old ladies, nothing to do. Anywho. Uh, uh, but... uh, and the girl, the girl suddenly writes a book. And through the character in the book, she does all the things she's wanted to do, but never dared. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. You like it so far? Oh, I think it's wonderful. Now, what happens next? Well, uh, 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 that's as far as I got. Well, could you help carry out Mr. DeMille? Oh, I think it's such let, a good let, let idea. Let me see now. Let me see. Yes. At the end of the picture, the girl, the girl, she comes back to the town. And let me see. I seem to feel something about a baby. Mm -hmm. I don't know just what it is, but the idea will come. I'll get it. Yeah. Oh, now, look. She's holding the baby in her arms. The boy thinks it's her baby, but it really isn't. He starts to go away, and she runs after him, and everything turns out all right. Huh. Yeah, now, you see, we're in overstored. Nothing to it. <laughs> well, I'm awfully sorry, Carrie, but you're a little late. We've already made that picture. Oh, you, uh, you did it, huh? Mm-hmm. Yes, we called it the Buccaneer. <laughs> <laughs> well, well let, let's do it again and call it Irene Dunn Goes Wild. Well, that's just what I'm about to do, Mr. DeMille. <laughs> well, when you do find your story, Irene, it's going to be a good one. We've yet to see you in anything but a hit picture. Thank you, sir. It's been grand coming back here again. And playing a part on a program that I listen to with so much enjoyment. And we hope you'll return again and again, Miss Dunn. You too, Carrie. Oh, that's fine, Mr. DeMille. As a matter of fact, I'm working on a radio story right now. It's about a small town girl who writes a Good book. Good night, Mr. Next... DeMille. Oh, no, wait a minute. This I... way, Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Good night, Irene, and thank you, Carrie. We also thank Columbia Studio, whose latest production is You Can't Take It With You, and through whose courtesy tonight's play was presented. The stars and play in store for you next Monday night are announced presently by Mr. DeMille. Assisting tonight's stars were Noreen Gamil as Aunt Elsie, Lou Merrill as Mr. Stevenson, Myra Marsh as Ethel Stevenson, Joe Duvall as Jed Waterbury, John Fee as Mr. Dane, Helen Christian as Agnes, Lee Millar as Uncle John Lynn, Sybil Harris as Mrs. Hanks, Mary Lansing as Secretary, Chris Coffin as Tony, Jack Morrison as Newsboy, Frank Nelson, Sidney Newman, and David Kerman as Reporters. The original story, Theodora Goes Wild, was written by Mary McCarthy. Louis Silvers appeared through courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studios, where he was in charge of music for the new picture, Three Blind Mice. Mr. DeMille. Since the first of the year, Hollywood has been without the services of one of its finest actors and favorite citizens. But refreshed by a vacation in New York, he's just returned and has chosen the Lux Radio Theater as the scene of his first Hollywood appearance in many months. The star <clears throat> is Frederick March, who, with his lovely wife Florence Eldridge, will be here next Monday night in Manslaughter, that memorable play in which he starred on the screen. Manslaughter is based on the novel by Alice Dewar Miller, and is the melodramatic romance of a district attorney whose life is law, and of a willful young society girl whom he's forced to send to prison before they finally find happiness. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Frederick March and Florence Eldridge in Manslaughter with James Gleason. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. This program, ladies and gentlemen, came to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Flakes, those fine gentle soap flakes used in the wardrobe departments of all the leading studios in Hollywood and by thoughtful women everywhere. As Mr. DeMille told you, next Monday night we bring you Frederick March and Florence Eldridge in that great play of romance and melodrama, Manslaughter. So listen in again next Monday night. Be part of the large audience that gathers each week from coast to coast to hear Hollywood's celebrated stars in the finest plays of stage and screen. And so, until next Monday night, this is your announcer, Melville Ruick, bidding you all good night. Thanks for the memory heard tonight was from the big broadcast of 1938. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.